Is there anybody here who has or wants to consider crowdsourcing? Raising money from the crowd. You are? Have you done it or are you looking to do it? Looking to do it. Why? Is that a good, how would that help you? Going that route specifically. Good entry level way to get into finances. Anybody else have a, a thought or experience about crowdsourcing your way? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's been successful? Well, great. Some, yeah? Well, you're going to learn more than you can imagine in this segment, which is pass the hat around, how to crowdsource your next round. And, <clears throat> excuse me, we have people that, uh, we have Joe Chin, who is the founder and CEO of Sparrow. They're here, actually, uh, his, um, his group and his software. He raised a half million in two weeks. So it's great to have him. Uh, we also have Philip Michael, who holds two records for crowdsourcing. So let's bring you guys up to the stage. We also have joining us virtual, Renji Bajoy. Take it away, guys. Can't wait to hear about all this. All right. Round of applause for them. Everybody, Renji here. All right, everybody. Good to see you all. And hey, all of you out there, if you're here to learn how to make uh, raise millions of dollars by putting your company on a website, please come on in. There's plenty <laughs> of seats. All right, so welcome to our session. I'm Joe Chin, your host, four-time serial entrepreneur with two exits. I got Philip uh, Michael over there, uh, who's What's raised up? one million, uh, the fastest in real estate. And we have Renji Bijoy here on video with us, who's raised one yeah. million dollars in eight hours and $9 million total for his equity crowd fundraise. And we're gonna to talk to you about the best practices of how to do this. Uh, well, by a show of hands, how many people here know what equity crowdfunding is? Okay, good, we got like half the people here. And how many people here were actually headed to the uh, sex tech session and just took a wrong turn? <laughs> Some people, okay, just checking, just checking. Okay, no, no, we're, we're, we're gonna get busy here too, so don't worry about that. Um, and don't worry if, if, no worries if you don't know what equity crowdfunding is because we're gonna start off with a quick primer so everybody knows what that is. And then we're gonna dive into the best practices of how all three of us have been successful in this new medium. Okay, so equity crowdfunding. For all you entrepreneurs, you know, the dream is real. You know, you can put your company up on a website like WeFunder or Start Engine, and anybody can invest in your company for as little as $100, okay? Now, a little bit of history. Equity crowdfunding has been around for a long time, but the limit has always been $1 million, which sort of made it like an okay proposition. But just this last March, they raised that limit to $5 million, and all of a sudden that changes the game because now you can raise multiple millions, almost equivalent to a venture capital type investment. Okay? And we're going to go through the best practices because, of course, with anything, you have to do it right. And so we're going to share those best practices with you. So best practice number one is use social media. And look, we are so lucky to have uh, Renji here with us because he is the king of doing this. As I mentioned, he, met, he raised $1 million in just eight hours. So Renji, uh, we're going to talk to you about this. But before we do that, why don't you give us just uh, 10 seconds on Immersed and what Immersed does? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we're partnered with uh, Facebook and Microsoft and HTC to build virtual reality offices. So, I mean, because of COVID, everyone's working from home. Uh, and so now we have tens of thousands of people who are putting on a VR headset every week to actually work full time in VR with their remote teams. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, like Joe was saying, we had actually raised uh, $2 million in our first round within like three or four days and then raised an additional round, maybe seven months later, 8 million bucks within 17 days. Renji, I said, I think, I think Renji is almost like the superstar of, of one day raising. So let's, let's uh, take a look at that, that first day. I mean, you obviously went out uh, and did tremendously well. Uh, give us the, uh, the, the background story. I mean, how did that happen? How did it come about? How'd you approach it? Yeah. So the way it started was um, I had had a larger network of just friends, family, uh, and then just users and followers who had been following our progress for years at that point. We started Immersed back in 2017 and had raised our first uh, crowdfunding round in summer 2020. So 
uh, at that point had three years of building somewhat of a network of people just following the progress of this cool technology. But then once COVID hit, it was somewhat of a catalyst for us to make it very clear that um, the case for our business is a very strong one. And I think the partnerships with the tech giants really did uh, help solidify that. And so um, I think that as we were prepping for uh, raising a $2 million round or whatever our goal was at the time, I had actually asked about 40 or 45 of my friends via text, hey, if we were to uh, raise a crowdfunding round as opposed to just continually doing VC, because at that point we'd only raised about like $1.75 million uh, in those previous three years through VC, but it was it was a struggle to get any sort of VC money because VCs generally want to see, uh, you know, a website product is uh, just cash flow positive, you know, doesn't have any financial struggles or whatever, very quick to make revenue. Whereas for us, we're, we, were, we were a very heavy R&D company. So um, when it came to VCs, they were just thinking, okay, MRR. When I talked to literally everyone else on the planet, they were like, oh, wow, this 100%, 100% should be a thing. You have these partnerships in place with these tech giants. I don't understand why you can't just take my money. And so that's when we had opened up that uh, crowdfunding round. And that's why I texted about 45 of my friends saying, hey, uh, you'd mentioned at some point in the past uh, how many years that you wanted to give money to the startup. Well, now's your chance. And 40 of the 45 said that they wanted to be part of the round. And then I just had them comment, like, and share on all of the posts that I posted on social media around our crowdfund. And then from there, a ton of Facebook. Can I ask you about that? First. Because yeah. I think you, you almost use the term uh, growth squad for, for those folks. Can you sort of explain that part of it, which I thought was fascinating when we talked yeah. about it originally? Yeah, we called them a growth squad because these were people who were going to help support the fundraise, right? So they were essentially going to be the testimonials for social validation or social proof that I'm not just randomly asking for money on the internet, right? Because that'd be a very odd thing to do. So uh, these 40 people, the day before we actually went uh, public uh, or, or went live on our crowdfunding campaign, um, I had texted them the day before, hey, go ahead and put your money in the actual private link, uh, the WeFunder page. And then the next morning, as soon as we go live, uh, go ahead and comment on all the posts that I post on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn, et cetera. And so I made sure to very systematically copy and paste all those links to all 40 people saying, hey, go ahead and write, um, hey, Renji, we're in. Uh, thanks so much for letting us be part of this uh, journey, blah, blah, and whatever other encouraging words. And so once you have 40 people in the course of you know, three minutes commenting on a single post, all of the social media algorithms start really picking it up. And it was crazy. In that first day, the Facebook video uh, got over 10,000 views. The Twitter video had something like 40,000 impressions. The Instagram video had about 15,000 views. And these were just friends of friends of friends of friends. Uh, zero dollars spent on marketing. No, that's amazing. That's amazing. And just to give the crowd some context, because you did mention how you built up your social following over years. How many followers do you think you had when you first did that, that, that raise, when you opened it up? Yeah, so for the, uh, the, we did a $2 million round summer 2020, and then an $8 million round March 2021. So before the summer 2020 round, um, on Instagram I had maybe uh, 1,200 just friends who followed me on Instagram. And then Facebook, maybe about 2,000 Facebook friends, you know, people from high school, elementary school, uh, you know, different churches I've been part of throughout the years and things like that. So um, then I think from that first crowdfunding campaign, um, that got more and more eyeballs onto my initial campaign and thus had a bunch of people start following from there. And then in the months preceding the $8 million round, I had very intentionally started um, just follow on the kind of the, you know, the typical growth hack um, around just follow, unfollow people on uh, Instagram and Twitter and everywhere else. And on top of that, I'd also uh, sent blasts out to our users saying, hey, um, if we ever do raise another round, let your friends and family know that you know we might be doing another one in the future. Um, I think it was another advantage that I hit Forbes 30 under 30 back in December of 2020. So between the two rounds, and that did bring in another influx of angel investors who uh, creeped on my backgrounds, found that we did a crowdfunding round, and had reached out saying, hey, if you ever do another one, let me know. So once that list hit about 300 angel investors interested to have the conversation, um, I just made sure to add them to a mailing list. And as soon as I first got my friends and family in for the $8 million round, I then blasted it to those angel investors, then blasted it to um, our user base and uh, just other VCs and stuff. And so this most recent $8 million round, 
about just over $2 million of that $8 million round was uh, VC, was, you know, subsequent like $5.8 million or whatever it was, uh, almost $6 million was just from users, followers, friends, family. Get to that topic in a second. Uh, just a quick segue for all of you who are here. Uh, we have a presentation. If you point your camera at that, you can take a look at that, and I'll help you follow along what we're talking about. All right. So let's jump to uh, our number two best practice, and this comes right from Philip, who's right here, who once again uh, was the fastest to raise a million dollars in the real estate category using equity crowdfunding. Um, and that best practice is to use storytelling. So Philip, do you want to give us a background on how you did it? Well, if I can, can you hear me okay? All right, if I can add to what Renji said, uh, social media was a very important component of what it was that I did. Uh, Speak a little louder. You guys can hear me okay? Yeah. All okay. right. So a very important component of what we did was to incorporate social media in a similar way. I just used a different methodology. Uh, what I did was I just started producing content around what it is that I was doing. Well, Philip, why don't you give us that background, actually? What does NYC you do? Uh, I think that falls right into it. What it is is we have a, we have a fintech. We, they call Yahoo Finance calls us the Robin Hood of real estate, and that's effectively a good way to put it. Is we have an app that allows that allows people to buy and own real estate in micro fractional shares, a hundred dollars a pop, right? And the reason we did that, number one, is to right now in North America, there's a widening wealth gap between minorities and European. White folks, right? And I'm half white, I can say that. <laughs> so, um, so what it was is that the main driver behind that is that people of color don't own real estate at the same rate. So what I wanted to do was, our mission is to create 100,000 millionaires of color by 2030. And by having that low barrier to entry, is not that this $100 is going to turn you into a millionaire, it's going to get you excited and curious about investing. And that can ultimately take you to, to that point. And I use a 10-year horizon because that's what it will take on a, and if you, if you just do things consistently, but it's another conversation. But what I did was I just started with a video, first video I ever did. I, like Renji, I had friends and family on my Instagram. Did one video, got 300,000 views. It got picked up by one page. Then another one took it, got 70,000 views. And next thing you know, I had 10,000 followers. And fast forward, I had 100,000 in less than a year. So that's, but that was just from putting out stuff, sharing what I've learned in my journey as an entrepreneur. But and it goes back to the point that, you know, the best practice number two, storytelling, yes. articulating your why. That's extremely important because it makes it easy for people to see what you do. And one of the biggest mistakes that I see uh, from entrepreneurs is that they for In equity crowdfunding. Period. Okay, period. Uh, they forego common sense. They make it too complicated. If a fifth grader can't understand what you're doing, to me, in my personal opinion, I don't see the thesis. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't see the case, the business case. If, I, if you can't articulate it to a fifth grader, I, I just don't see it. And that's what I was able to do. I share stuff like uh, how to get started with very, very basic things like dollar cost averaging, index funds, how to get into real estate, REITs, very basic stuff. And within that, articulating why we're doing it. And then right. through that, people just got curious. And I never would push it. I would never sell it. I, tr I tried one time with a paid ad. It was a disaster. And all it got was you know one of those Facebook ads that got people writing dumb stuff. So I said, you know what, to hell with this. It seemed to be working on its own. Right, right. And it just picked up steam. And, 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 and like I said, no one really knew me. But again, I just focused on delivering value and articulating the why. And that's where storytelling comes into it. And it has to permeate everything you're doing. Whether, and that's my journalism background that comes into this, but <laughs> whether it's being very precise with the, the piece of content you put out right. or even the way you put, put together your page. You have to speak to the audience and meet them where they are. Right. And that's, again, another typical mistake because people are used to being here in the weeds, jargon galore, right. and then you lose them. That's great. That's great. And hopefully that resonates with the crowd. Does everybody feel like, especially the entrepreneurs out there? Well, firstly, how many entrepreneurs do we have out there? By, by show of hands. All right. Let me ask you this uh, in, in Philip's words. Do all of you feel like you're articulating the why very clearly in your messaging? Oh, I see some no's there. Some, OK, all right, there we go, there we go. So that is our, our second best practice. Um, our third best practice, especially in regard to equity crowdfunding, probably all fu fundraising, is updates, frequent updates. And I'm going to take this one, because that's true to what we did. And my 10-second intro is, uh, well, firstly, I raised uh, half a million in just two weeks. 
for my startup, Sparrow. And what Sparrow does is we use AI to help athletes improve. Starting with golfers, and you, you see we're doing something right over there. So if someone films you with the Sparrow app and you're doing an athletic motion, the AI will analyze what you're doing, your golf swing, your soccer shot, tell you what you're doing wrong, and give you tips on how to improve. We are actually doing an equity crowdfund now on WeFunder. So you can find us at wefunder.com slash Sparrow app, or check us out over there. But updates, um, especially when you're doing equity crowdfunding, are vitally important. And what do I mean by that? I mean updates about you, your company, any sort of milestone that you hit. And it doesn't have to be something big. It could be, hey, we hit 500 investors today. Um, it can even be an article. For example, um, Renji mentioned Forbes. We also were written up in Forbes. We took that and we blasted it out everywhere. Social media, we even put it out on paid marketing. So it almost appeared like an article in an ad. Um, and these sort of updates as you go through a financing, particularly for e equity crowdfunding, are incredibly valuable. And this comes from just basic marketing. Um, for those of you who are in the marketing field, you may know or have heard the theory that you have to have multiple touch points for a consumer before they're going to buy. It's the same thing for fundraising. They have to have multiple touch points about your company, but especially about you, all of you who are entrepreneurs. So one of the things about crowdfunding is you have to be open about your life. Meaning you have to, when you do an equity crowdfunding, I've heard this over and over from my colleagues who've done equity crowdfunding, you have to open up and just show parts of your life. You have to film selfies just talking about how things are going. You have to be on video. You talked about, you, you heard all of us talk, uh, talking about being on video. You have to be comfortable doing that and not just for the main video, but over and over and over again. And that uh, we found to be vitally important uh, in terms of equity crowdfunding. So that is the psychology and the background of personal updates. Uh, moving on, and this is maybe less uh, of a best practice, but more of an interesting topic of discussion. And that is how, how do VCs or traditional investments coexist or not with equity crowdfunding? Um, and I think we want to go to, uh, to Renji right away because Renji just mentioned a, a little while ago that he had VCs in his round. And the reason why I bring it up is uh, one, because while the valuations, at least uh, the broad perception, are different in equity crowdfunding and traditional funding. Um, and what that means very, very bluntly is that in equity crowdfunding, you're marketing to the crowd. You can actually set your valuation higher. And that is just like the, the, the ball truth there. Uh, but often that puts you at odds with traditional uh, investors who are kind of used to, well, negotiating. <laughs> I don't know, how many of you here have raised financing? Okay. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? When you raise, yep, you gotta go through that negotiation. And it's often, okay, butting the heads on valuation. Um, with equity crowdfunding, uh, there's really no one that's, that's uh, negotiating with you. You sort of put it out there and you just go. Um, but Renji, let's hear your take. How do these two worlds uh, sort of coexist? Yeah, so I felt like <clears throat> equity crowdfunding was very freeing because um, in every VC, so, so again, we raised maybe about 1.75 million of VC before we ever touched crowdfunding. Um, and clearly every VC who ever negotiates with you uh, to fund your company, obviously they believe in the vision and the mission of your company, but they are financially incentivized to lower your valuation so that they can maximize their portion or their stake in the company. And so um, clearly it seems like there's somewhat of a um, monopolistic or almost uh, just, just a level of control or leverage that they have that you cannot um, have yourself in that situation unless you know you're, you have a ton of VCs who are just throwing money at you. At that point, you get the VCs against each other. But even at that point, they can still go behind the scenes and set whatever valuation uh, that they want to agree to. And at the end of the day, you're at their mercy. Whereas in the crowdfunding world, you get to, like you mentioned, you get to set your price and at the end of the day, if the price is too high, people are not going to want to invest in general. Um, and if you set it too low, well, you know, that's your own fault. But I think at the end of the day, it was extremely freeing to be able to set my own price uh, because we had competitors who had priced theirs even higher. And I felt like my price was actually a good deal. So I could still get friends and family in and give them a long-term um, ROI on. But it was still higher than what VCs had wanted. 
an adverse so, situation uh, in that regard, in terms of valuations, because um, often it's the other way around, I feel, you know, that the equity crowdfund valuation is actually higher. Um, and uh, Philip, do you have any thoughts on that? Have you seen those two worlds collide a bit? <laughs> well, yeah, I get, I, get the, I get the argument, the logical argument that you can price it according, you know, more founder friendly. I went, I went about it a little differently is because I haven't used investors VC by design on purpose. The reason I did it, again, was pandemic shut everything down and everybody was freaking out. I wanted to offer some sort of uh, positive light. And what I did is, long story short, I carved out a smaller portion of the, of the company, which we own completely. And then I put that out at what I felt was a discount to value. And fast forward 12 months, there's a 2x equity multiple on that investment. So I was proven right. But I actually priced it at a lower than I really should have. <laughs> but I looked at that for a number of purposes. Nobody knew who I was. Uh, nobody knew what we did, really. And it was also real estate. Not a lot of people had done it. None of the platforms really wanted to, to, to deal with it. So I, I was uncertain. Now, it's, things have changed now, obviously. And any future rounds, because people know, is going to be market value. Cool. Better believe it. But my idea was, number one, to give it to the people who never had access, make sure they made money on the buy, make sure they had a good experience so they would tell their friends and be excited about it and just, and just hammer home and, 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 and kickstart this whole mutation of prosperity. That's what I wanted to do. And I did it a very, very small portion of it so I could, so I could shoulder it. But I get your point, but that's not what I did. Yeah, I did no, it the no, other no, way. Totally, yeah. Totally, yeah. yeah, everybody yeah. has their own path. Mm -hmm. Okay, so moving on to, uh, so we can get through all these best practices because we're running low on time. Uh, messaging. Okay, so what is very important in equity crowdfunding, and once again, this sort of permeates from all financing, is to put out the proper messaging. And the two things that we've uh, picked up as best practices are FOMO, meaning fear of missing out. Um, and this is something which is a little bit different versus when you're just talking to investors, because everything when you do an equity crowdfund is actually on the site, meaning you can see how much money has been raised, and often you can see how much is left in early, in either the allocation, sometimes there's an early bird going on, and there's a limited amount that people can take, or the round itself. And um, I think, Philip, you want to chime in on that? Have you seen uh, different things happen with you when you got towards the end of the round? Yeah, the final day when they said there's 24 hours left, you know, uh, <laughs> then you saw a lot. That was the most, we've, I did like 100K in a day, just from that thing. Uh, where they see there was 24 hours left. And they came after and said, can we get in? I said, absolutely not, you snoozed, <laughs> yes. too bad. But you know, but, it, but it's, it's absolutely a real thing. And it's almost very real, particularly with the type of audience where it's micro investments. Yeah. And it's, it does certainly fit that. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and Renji, I know uh, this is something you and I have talked about. How, have you used FOMO in terms of your messaging and the like? Yeah, so FOMO is, it, you always have to think about who is your audience, right? So if you talk about, for example, me posting this crowdfunding campaign to LinkedIn or Twitter, where people aren't necessarily as, um, you know, they just don't love me as much as my friends or my family do. If you try to post it to social media or like, like Twitter or LinkedIn, where people don't care about you as much too soon, they actually won't see the kind of meter running out. They won't see you getting as much traction. So if you get to get your friends and family to invest first, you build up the amount of capital that's in your campaign, you have a little bit left, then you have those less uh, involved investors who are like, you know what, let me throw some money in just so I don't miss out. Uh, my point is, start with the people who care about you more, then start exposing it to those who, you know, would be more open to it if they saw more social proof first. And uh, the other part of messaging that I'm gonna cover is third party, what we call third party. Meaning when you get other people investing, a lot of times you can tap into almost that affinity group. For example, I'm, look, I'm a native New Yorker and I went to Columbia. Um, and so I have a whole bunch of Columbia alums in my round. So what we simply did is we took all of their photos just from online, we put it to music, and we just put it out as an update. And then of course that resonated with all the other Columbia alums <laughs> because they're like, oh, well, this must be a good thing for Columbia alums to, to invest in. So even just that type of thing, and we're probably going to do it for, I went to Stuyvesant too, if you know that school, so I'm going to do it for them, so on and so forth. So all good things in terms of using that third party messaging. Um, okay, good. So a couple other things that uh, we want to cover, because I do think we need to wrap up. Um, I do want to tell you some important things, so don't move yet. Um, we will be doing another best practices event on equity crowdfunding soon. 
So you'll see that at uh, bestpracticesbusiness.com, where we'll go into even more detail, perhaps with these gentlemen as well. Um, as I mentioned, Sparrow's running a crowdfund, so feel free to join in. It's a great way to learn, too, to check out our, our, our uh, campaign on WeFunder. And if you want more information, please feel free to come up and talk to me. You can reach out to Renji. He's always happy to talk, or Philip. And I, we also have uh, my buddy Elena from WeFunder. Elena, do you want to stand up? She, uh, WeFunder is one of the big equity crowdfund portals, so she has a wealth of knowledge. Feel free to hit her up there. Um, and just to recap on the session generally, yeah, once again, for you entrepreneurs, you know, the dream is real, and we've all lived it. You can put your company up on a site, and once again, anybody can invest in the company. They don't have to be an accredited investor, so none of that stuff, for as little as $100. And if you do it, if you use the right best practices, uh, you can really do well. Um, so before we break, I, wanted, I want everybody to give a hand to our two superstar equity crowdfund entrepreneurs, Philip and Renji. Thank you very much and for sharing their knowledge. Thank you for everybody for hanging out with us. And uh, yeah, let's uh, keep building the future. All righty, we're out. <laughs>